Okay, so the lesson that I want to present to you, um, so the first thing I want to explain to you is that everything that I'm about to tell you is just, it's just like how I roll. You know, it's not necessarily true, it's not necessarily the way, but if you, the way that I look at teaching and learning about being a writer is, it's kind of like wearing different clothes. You know, you go, you go to the Ross and all of a sudden you find yourself in the women's section buying women's clothes and you, you put them on and you like them or you don't, you know what I mean? So like, it's okay to go into the, to the men's section or the women's section or, and, and try out different things and take them off and put them back on again. So you're just trying on something today. That's all you're doing. If you go, wow, I love what this dude taught and I wanna go and try to do that, awesome. If you're like, that guy's terrible, I never want to do that, then <laughs> don't do it, right? But see, what that does is that allows you to narrow down to what you really want to do, right? And you have to always be open, right? So I want you to always be open as, as, as much as you can. And the acronym for this is HOW. You might know the HOW acronym. This comes from psychology. Be honest, open, and willing, all right? So that's all I'm asking you to do, is to be honest with yourself, be open to what I'm saying, and be willing to give it a shot. And then if you hate it, move on, right? No reason to torture yourself because you don't like something. So there's this big problem with poetry. Maybe it's a problem with everything. But there's this big, big, big problem. The problem is that it is subjective. subjective. And when I say subjective, what do I mean by that? What does subjective mean? Um, it varies depending on the person. It varies depending on the person. It being, Subjective. I'm gonna get myself some water. This is, this is drinkable, right? <laughs> this is potable, right? I really don't care. I got it. We're good. Unless, we, unless you have it, like, unless you have it, right now. I do. I have it right here. Um, okay, so <laughs> it's subjective, and it being, yeah, poetry is very subjective. It varies, um, but. What varies about poetry? What is the it? We're using pronouns, no pronouns. What is the it? What varies? How to make it? Okay, tell me your name again. Jalexia. Jalexia. Mm -hmm. It's unique, so it'll take you just a little. You're, you're, you're the one. <laughs> There's always one. Um, Cassidy, or maybe? Yeah. Did you say somebody over here? Oh, no. So it's, it's varied in the way that it's made, and somebody over here said something. Was you Amanda? Maybe. Okay, Amanda, <laughs> what did you say? This is an interactive, interactive lesson. The subjective is the meaning it could be given. Right, what it says, what it means. There's another level of subjectivity, and that is, is it good? Like, you know what I'm saying? People say, oh, I love this poet, and I read them, and I'm like, oh, they're so bad. <laughs> and we're both right at the same time. It's very frustrating. Okay, so as a writer, I found this to be very, very, very frustrating. Um, so, um, lyric narrative is this concept that I did not come up with. I'm about to teach you about how I come up with. But what it does is it tempers that subjectivity. What it does is it it's essentially like a type of poetry or a way of thinking about poetry and a way that you can sort of measure it. Now, when you say, you know, has anybody in here seen Dead Poet Society? Yeah, there's that scene of J. Alfred Pritchard and he says, it's on the scale, and then they, they eat the lesson and they throw it out and the guy gets in trouble. Well, while, while I agree that that is excrement, I also disagree with that. Having a way to measure your work <laughs> is not a bad idea. It's just one of the many tools that the poet can have. Okay, now I'm a very scientifically minded sort of weird guy. I like to have measuring tools for things. It's just my way of doing it. Um, and so this is sort of a measuring tool and a revision tool. It's pretty exciting once you get into it. So this comes, the root of all this is from this poet, Greg Orr. Has anybody in here read, read Greg Orr before? Okay, the two uh, professors in the background and the one up at the front ground have read Greg Orr. He's a pretty wonderful poet, old school. Is he still alive? Well, is Greg Orr still living? Yeah, he's not a yeah, you're still alive, Greg Orr. I honestly, the other day was like, I'm Sorry. not sure. <laughs> he's been around a long he's time. He's still alive and publishing books. I know, I know, it's very frustrating. I just didn't know if he was actually alive and publishing. I just knew he was publishing. I'm kind of making a joke here, but he's an old dude, right? He's been around a long time. He's got some knowledge. He wrote this a long time ago. 
He wrote this essay called The Four Temperaments of, of the Forms of Poetry. He argues that all poets have a basic instinct, a basic temperament, when it comes to the types of poems they write. Okay, there's four of them. Four, just, just, just one idea. Story, structure, music, and imagination. All right, so right there with that subjectivity of type, he's narrowing it down to four, there are four basic types. So we're already getting rid of some of that subjectivity. Now there's others, of course, but he's saying there's four basic types that most people fall into, right? Story, structure, music, and imagination. And then he puts them in this neat little chart, which makes me, the scientist, just so very happy. Of these four temperaments, there are two categories. There's either finite or infinite. Finite means, who knows what finite means? Limited, good. Infinite means not limited, right? Infinity, right? Okay, we can also say fixed or unfixed. So your story, if you just tell the story of this class, and you just stick to the truth, it's finite, right? You know, this kind of funny looking guy came up in the front and taught the class. That's more or less what happened, right? Some subjectivity in there because you call me funny looking, but that was it. Okay, <laughs> it's fixed. Then we have structure. Okay, well, let's go back to structure. We have a dramatic beauty, we have a beginning, we have a middle, we have an end, there's conflict. If you don't have conflict, you don't have a story. There's dramatic focus, there's resolution. Okay, resolution doesn't mean solution, by the way. It just means it's resolved in some form, which maybe means it ends without the ending being negative. But okay, so there's some play here. Then we have structure, okay? The satisfaction of measurable patterns. It's akin to higher math, geometry, theoretical physics, and beauty and balance equations. It manifests, manifests itself in sonnets, Belnells, Sestinas, other types of closed structures. So you have the poets who only write in structure, and that is fixed. Right? A sonnet, even though sonnets, you know, of course, because we're poets, we sort of made the sonnet into almost anything you want. But the basic definition of a sonnet is 14 lines with a turn around the sixth or eighth line. Now, if you want to get more serious, you go with this. There's a rhyme scheme of a who, huh? Yeah. I thought you were you going to say something about rhyme schemes? Okay. okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, you can have rhyme schemes and all this. But the bottom line is, if you're really writing a sonnet, it's got 14 lines in a volta, which is a word that Lana likes, around the sixth or eighth line. That's what happens in a sonnet. So it's fixed. You have to do these certain things, okay? Then we have these two other sets that are unfixed, that are infinite, that can, you can limit them if you want, but they can go forever if you want as well. One of them is music, right? I mean, think about, do you ever get on Spotify and just click random? It's almost like, whew, I get tired. I get kind of like panicky because I feel like my atoms are spreading apart and I'm about to just become part of the ether because there's so much and it's so varied. There's so much different stuff out there, which is beautiful. And you can listen to Mozart and Mac Miller in the same 10 minutes. It's unbelievable, right? Same thing in poetry and in fiction, by the way. All this applies to fiction too, but we're coming out of time. So we have rhythm and sounds, developments and resolutions involved. Syntax, the syllabic qualities of English that turn in rhyme, pitch, duration, stretch, wildness, softness, and the entire panoply of sound effects, alliteration, accents, consonants, internal rhyme, etc. I mean, it goes on forever. And you can have a poem that uses uh, only the letter, uh, the only sound that repeats is the letter A, right? You could do this, I wouldn't suggest it, but you could do it. Or you could make a poem that only repeats the letter Z. Wouldn't do that either. Or you could have a poem that, that has a repetition of all of the letters in the alphabet throughout the whole thing. Or, you know, who knows mathematics and like one times two times three times four times five times six times seven times eight all the way to 26. That number is so big you can't even imagine. You can't see it in your head. That's the number of options you have just for alliteration and assonance alone. It goes on forever. This is what's so dope about the English language, as Amanda has expressed her sentiments. Then we have the imagination, and then we get, then, then things get really wacky. This is as infinite as it gets, right? So you have a story, right? Up today, this class, this funny looking guy came in and taught the class, right? It's fixed. He was wearing a blue shirt, had a 
have two of a bird on his left arm and five braces, right? But if you want to go to imagination, you can start imagining what I'm really thinking in my head. I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking just what I'm saying. You can imagine where I'm from. You can imagine what my drive is like up here. You can imagine all sorts of things just about me. You can imagine how many different things you can imagine about what's going on in the minds of the people in this classroom, what conflicts they're dealing with, how those are getting resolved right here, right now in this classroom, right? You can imagine anything. You can imagine that we're doing this on a different planet. You can do anything you want with reality, right? So you've got this fixed thing, but then you add imagination to it and sound, and all of a sudden, the whole thing opens up, okay? So now what Orr says is that a poet is born is born, literally, man, comes out of the womb, born this way. <laughs> That's what happens when you're born, you cry. You know why you cry when you're born? To clear the passageway so you can breathe oxygen for the first time in your life, and it really, really sucks. It's really hard work, all right? When you're born with one temperament, he says, then he or she, this is old, should be he, she, or they, grows as a poet by developing that temperament. What are our four temperaments again? Story, structure, music, imagination. But also by nurturing the others. Okay? So you develop that temperament and you nurture the others. Kind of like having four kids. You like one and you nurture the other two. That's <laughs> why I don't want four like that. <laughs> the greatest poem is one in which all four temperaments are present in the strongest degree. Now that's emboldened for a reason. The greatest poem, that is the quote, I didn't say it. All right, don't blame me, because this is like hard, y'all. All right, is one, one poem in which all four temperaments are present, present, in the strongest degree. Okay, now that, I don't think he means that you're singing and structural and imagining and story all in equal amounts, but they're present in the strongest form, uh, way possible there, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear, but what was that? Well, what was what? Could you repeat what you just said? That, uh, I'm not sure the thing. Oh, you want me to sing? <laughs> you guys missed it too, didn't you? You could be singing. You guys want to do it again, right? <laughs> Right? Go, come on, say yes. Singing? You want me to sing? Yes. 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 My regrets look just like texts I didn't send. I'm not going to send you that text, all right? <laughs> Relax. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing all throughout this weekend, this week. All right. The greatest poem is one in which all four temperaments are present in the strongest degree. Like so. Now we get to go to Venn diagrams. I mean, it just doesn't get better than this, y'all. That is the best poem I've ever written. It's right there. And it is the best, right? That is the greatest poem, right? Now, I've tried to foreshadow a little bit. Hopefully you're picking up on it. If not, you'll be surprised. When we take these various temperaments and call them elements, all of a sudden we have a revision tool, okay? So this is something that's functional. I'm not just telling you how to analyze a poem. I don't want you to spend a lot of time analyzing so let's say we write a villanelle. Who knows what a villanelle is? Oh, we, we, we talked about it. We talked it. about it? Okay. So let's say you write a villanelle, which is a highly structural form. Very hard to write. I don't know why anyone does this to themselves, right? Of course, I'm a poet, which I don't know why. I've been doing this to myself for 24 years? Yeah, 23 years. I don't know why. Okay. Let's say we write a villanelle that your workshop complains is all structure and music with little substance. We can create a simple diagram to illustrate this problem. So what we have here is story and music. We love it, man. It's beautiful. But where's the imagination? Where's the story? You know? Like, where's our substance? Right? Now I would agree with that criticism. It's just a theoretical idea. Okay. It then becomes fairly simple to find a way to incorporate at least some story and imagination to make the poem perhaps more clear, vibrant, relatable, aka substance. Okay. When something says it's lacking substance, they're usually saying that they're not connecting with it. One of the easiest ways to connect with your audience is through story, right, and imagination. If it's just choral music in Italian, and you don't know Italian, you might, well, you might 
feel it, you might love it, but you might be like, man, what is Big Rose saying? He's measuring something on the floor for his bed or something. I don't know the whole story, right? That's a little more opera for you. Okay, so what you do is you come in and you just, you know, you don't mess with your structure and your music. You just move some of that imagination from here and here. You bring some story in. All of a sudden, right here is your poem, right? Just one particular idea. So this is a way to think about revision, okay? Not to just think about how poetry works, but to think about how you might make your poems work for people a little better. Okay, so now this is where Judy Jordan comes in. Judy Jordan, so far I have just taught you everything that Judy Jordan taught me. Does anybody know who Judy Jordan is? Lana and Rebecca do. Okay, you need to go to poemoftheweek.com. That's my, one of my literary projects. It's been going on for 13 years. A lot of amazing poets. You need to go to the archive, you need to go to Judy Jordan. She is an absolutely fabulous poet. And she's a lyric narrativist all day long. She just taught me everything I taught you. And now we're gonna get into a little deeper. So we call it lyric narrative. This is sort of, Judy, I'm claiming this is our theory, okay? It's her theory that I'm stealing, but I'm adding to it. Yeah, it's our theory, all right. <laughs> she's gonna be yelling at you soon. Okay, so instead of saying finite and infinite, we say there are, there's a lyric side to your temperament and there's a narrative side to your temperament. You have music, rhythm and sound, it develops with a syntax, same stuff from the last time. You have music and structure, that's your lyric. You can't have a song without structure. I mean, you kind of can. Have you ever listen to Patty Griffin? You know who Patty Griffin is? She's got structure, but she doesn't write choruses and stuff. It's like a poem, basically. They're like Leonard Cohen, you know? There's not a lot of repetition. But in most music, we love that repetition. When we get back to I like it like that, and then that's when we start dancing. And then we're like in the middle part, kind of like, yeah, I like it like that. All right, I saw that there's salsa lessons in that. And you know, all right. So that's our structure and our music, of course, is the sound of it and all that. You understand all this, right? Narrative. Okay, story and narrative are two different things. Story is a type. Narrative is a way. Story is like, you know, you sit down and there's a story there. Narrative is the pieces of story, right? Dramatic unity, the beginning, middle, and end, conflict, dramatic purpose, resolution, that's all narrative stuff. Not story, but elements of story. Okay, you don't have to tell a story in a poem to make sense, but it really helps if you have a character. It really helps if you have a setting. It really helps if you have a conflict, right? A poem will seem terribly substantive if there's no conflict. Again, that's not true, but it's often true, right? You understand what I'm getting at? Okay. Um, imagination. The flow of image to image, or thought to thought, and moves as a stream of association as concretely, flow, abstractly, metaphor, hyperbole, things like that. So metaphor, if you have a metaphor, if you have an extended metaphor, you know what an extended metaphor is? Okay, good, something you don't know, good, I can tell you. An extended metaphor is like, I'm writing about this Powerade bottle, but I'm really writing about a baby, right? I'm not sure how I'm going to do that, but right, so I describe it in such a way, I cradle the Powerade bottle in my arms um, because, I don't know, I can't get there, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, you're writing about a fish, but you're really writing about yourself. You're writing about um, apples in an orchard and how some of them fall before you pick them and they rot. And some of them you pick right when they're ready and some you pick before they're early and it's like a metaphor for dating. Ugh. Okay, all right. So we have extended metaphors and things like that. Those are all narrative elements. They don't necessarily tell stories, but they are narrative in, and they're narrative in nature, not lyrical, right? A metaphor, it's nothing, there's nothing really musical or lyrical about a metaphor. You can make it musical, but a basic metaphor um, is in and of itself narrative. So, let's look at some examples. So, flip to page whatever that is, where we have examples. Who wants to read this very first one in a station of the Metro by Ezra Pound? Are we still allowed to teach Ezra Pound? I sure hope so. Because it's in my, because I'm doing it. Yeah, Ezra sure. Pound is kind of a jerk, you know? Sure. Kind of, kind of a, kind of a fascist at the end of the day. 
Yeah. But I think this is a good example of what we're talking about. This is important stuff to think about. Who are the people who are writing things? But at the end of the day, we can still learn from them, take from them, and make better poems than they do, and write them out of the equation. Well, I'll be gone eventually. Okay, in a station at the Metro, who can read this to me? I know everybody's name, so I'll pick on some eventually. Alex, what do you think? You can't read. You can't read. <laughs> Man. Okay, well, I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna force you. Uh, let's see, Hannah, how about you? Okay, okay thank you. <clears throat> the aspirations of these faces in the crowd, petals on a red flag bow, lyric narrative. No, 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 stop, stop there. Oh, okay. You're good. Read it again. Go ahead, <laughs> just read it again. Okay. Sure. The aspirations of these faces in the crowd, petals on a red flag bow. So both bow. Bow. Okay, so one more time. This is, it's, uh, reading poetry is often an act of doing it again. Yeah, you're doing exactly what I want you to do. The apparitions of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet flag bow. The apparitions of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet flag bow. So, is this lyric, narrative, or lyric narrative? What do y'all think? Lyric says Michael. Okay, Amanda nodded. Yeah. Let's get the lyrics. Let's hear it for the lyrics. Who thinks it's lyric? Who thinks it's narrative? Who thinks it's lyric narrative? Ross has this funny feeling that perhaps he's in the minority here. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you are. Not that you're wrong, because there is narrative in here. You could argue. We have a setting. We have some people. What if we're gonna like put it on the Pritchard scale of Lyric versus imagination, I think we'll go with lyric, right? It's about the sound of it. It creates an image. It has a metaphor, right? So every poem, if you really want to argue, can have some narrative in it and some lyric in it, even when it, it can be a straight narrative poem that has barely any sound, but it's got just a little, right? But I think we can primarily say that this is a lyric poem. Now, this is a very famous poem. Of course, Ezra Pound was very famous and infamous at the same time. I'm making a joke here, infamous at the same time. Okay. But this is primarily, primarily a lyric poem, right? And if this is all you ever wrote, you know, people might be kind of tired of it. All these two-line poems with, no, with very little narrative, mostly lyric, you know, you might think about it another way, but this is also, what do you think of this poem? It's a nice little poem. Try to write a two-line poem better than this. Good luck. I don't know that anybody's ever done it, you know? There should probably be an anthology of two-line poems, right? It'd be about five pages long. <laughs> okay, not lots of them. Okay, let's go on to a poem by Bill Levine, who is in no way a fascist whatsoever. Very good man. We, uh, we have the, the good and the bad on the very first page. Who wants to read this for me? You'll do it? Thank you, Amanda. Go for it. <clears throat> out of burlap sacks, out of bearing butter, out of black bean and wet slate bread, out of the accidents of rage, the tango of tar, out of what in the world is that word? <laughs> Creosote? Creosote. Yes, right. drive shafts, wooden dollies, they run in grow. Out of, out of the gray hills, of industrial barns, out of rain, out of bus rides, West Virginia to kiss my ass, out of Barry Matthews, mothers carving like pounded stumps, out of stumps, out of the bones need to sharpen and the muscles to stretch, they run and grow. Earth is eating trees, fence posts, gutted cars, earth is calling and her little ones, come home, come home, from Creek Falls, from the ferocity of pig driven to holiness, from the furred ear and the full bell come, they rep the repose of the hung belly from the purpose they run and grow. From the sweet blues of the trotters, from the sweet kinks of the fist, from the full flower of the hams the thorax of calves, from bow down come rise up, come, the, come they lie in, from the root of shovel, the grain to arm that pulls the hand, they lie and grow. From my five arms and my hands, uh, and all my hands, from all my white sins forgiven, they feed, 
for my car passing under the stars. They lion, from children and parents. From the oak turned to a wall, they lion. From the from they sack and they belly open, and all that was hidden, burning on the oil stained earth. They feed, they lion, and plants. Thank you. Garcia Lorca, who, who helped me along with the, the little known, perhaps not so little known. So we'll transition on then to the next thing. Christopher Smart. About a year ago? Uh, it helped me, it gave me the kind of key, a key to writing the poems I needed to write about my own early life as an industrial worker in Detroit. They feed their lion. Out of burlap sacks out of bearing them, out of black bean and wet slate bread, out of the acids of rage, the candor of tar, out of creosote, gasoline, dried chefs, wooden dollars, they lie and grow. Out of the gray hills of industrial barns, out of rain, out of bus ride, West Virginia to kiss my ass, out of buried aunties, mothers hardening like pounded stumps, out of stumps, out of the bones need to sharpen and the muscles to stretch, they lie and grow. Earth is eating trees, fence posts, gutted cars. Earth is calling in her little ones, come home, come home, from pig balls, from the ferocity of pig driven to holiness, from the furred ear and the full jowl, from the repose of the hung belly, from the purpose they lie and grow. From the sweet glooms of the trotters, from the sweet kinks of the fist, from the full flower of the hams, the thorax of caves, from bow down, come rise up, come they lion from the reeds of shovels, the grained arm that pulls the hands, they lie and grow. From my five arms and all my hands, from all my white sins forgiven they feed, from my car passing under the stars, they lie in. From my children inherit. From the oak turned to a wall, they lie in. From they sack and they belly opened and all that was hidden, burning on the oil-stained earth, they feed, they lie in. And he comes. Thank you. So is that a lyric poem or a narrative poem or a lyric narrative poem? Okay. Now why do we say so Certainly, lyric narrative. There's definite story going on here, not a repetition of a lot of things that come across the ears. Mm -hmm. What's the story going on? I couldn't tell you, but when I first came out, you can feel it. Yeah. You know. So on the scale of narrative, is it here or is it here or is it here? It's here, kind of in the middle. You can feel it, but oh, that lyric. Oh. I almost cried. Thanks, for, uh, yeah, I did. Thanks so much. Hey, tomorrow you can be crying like a baby, right? I mean, it's gonna be really bad. I'm gonna cry a lot. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna cry a lot tomorrow. You're gonna see a very cheerful man. Man thing. <laughs> now you're gonna go. And Tia's like I'm there. <laughs> All right. Um, it's a beautiful poem. Now. Would you ever think that this is about the race riots in Detroit in 1976 when they burned Black Bottom, which is an extraordinarily large part of Detroit, right near downtown. It was an entirely black uh, neighborhood where they had their own businesses, their own culture, their own life. It was burned to the ground and riots and such. Would you ever think it was about that? No. Now that you know, you can read it and see that, but you wouldn't really know that. So there's narrative, but it's like, you know, it's not all there. It's still a primarily lyrical poem, but it's, it's, it's a lyric narrative poem. And boy, it's better than that first one, right? Even though that first one is one of the most famous poems that there is. <laughs> um, okay, now we'll take the same dude, Mr. Levine, and we'll read a different one. Now I'm gonna read this one for you. This is Jen. I thought we had 20. Okay, well, we're going to zoom. With this, what's, what's, I designed this all with, with a purpose. 
these first three encapsulate sort of the whole thing. So thank you. All right, gin by Philip Levine. The first time I drank gin, I thought it must be hair tonic. My brother swiped the bottle from a guy whose father owned a drugstore that sold booze in those ancient honorable days when we acknowledged this stuff was a drug. Three of us passed the bottle around, each tasting with disbelief. People paid for this? People had to have it the way we have had to have the women we never got near. Actually, they were girls, but never mind. The important fact was their impenetrability. Leo, the third foolish partner, suggested my brother should have swiped Canadian whiskey or brandy, but Eddie defended his choice on the grounds of the expressions Gin House and Gin Lane, both of which indicated the preeminence of gin in the world of drinking, a world we were entering. I lost my place, the world we were entering, without understanding how difficult exit might be. Maybe the bliss that came with drinking came only after a certain period of apprenticeship. Eddie likened it to the holy man's self-flagellation to experience the fullness of faith. He was very well read for a kid of 14 in the public school. So we dug in and passed the bottle around a second time and then a third in, si in the silence, each of us expecting some transformation. You get used to it, Leo said. You don't like it, but you get used to it. I know now that brain cells were dying for no earthly purpose. That three boys were becoming increasingly despiritualized even as they took into themselves these spirits. But I thought then I was at last sharing the world with the movie stars. That before long I would be shaving because I needed to. That hair would sprout across the flat prairie of my chest and plunge even to my groin. That first girls and then women would be drawn to my qualities. Amazingly, later, some of this took place. But first, the bottle had to be emptied. And then the three boys had to empty themselves of all they had so painfully taken in, and by means even more painfully, as they bowed, bowed by turns of the eye of the toilet bowl to discharge their shame. Ahead, lay cigarettes. The futility of guaranteed programs of exercise, the elaborate lies of conquest no one believed, forms of sexual torture and rejection undreamed of. Ahead lay our 14th birthdays, acne, deodorants, crabs, salves, butch haircuts, draft registration, the military of political victory of Dwight Eisenhower. Who bought us? Who brought us? Richard Nixon with wife and dog. Any wonder we tried Jim. Lyric, narrative, or lyric, narrative? Yeah. Narrative, a little bit of lyric, right? Okay, so as you move forward into poetry lives, you can do a little bit of all that stuff. You can revise and make your poems better, but make them more lyric, more narrative, whatever you're going to do, or you can throw all this out with the bath water, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>
the tools are out there. Uh, learn how to do all sorts of things. Um, yeah, it's a profession that's not. And here, let me give you my own. Um, but, uh, website, go to writing services. It doesn't matter what your age you are. None of that really matters. Um, you, get, you know, to take a build a portfolio and be able to make an argument that you can do the job. I can figure it out. But, you know, start with proofreading, which is pretty easy to work. It's tedious, but it's pretty easy. And then post copying and substitute editing, line editing, and, you know, all sorts of stuff. I just fell into it and yeah. decided I didn't want to teach anymore. Even obviously, I like doing it, but I don't. Yeah. Well, that's not the problem. Yeah. 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 Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a good, that was a good little, uh, good little class, huh? I'm, I'm from Chattanooga. Oh, cool. Fellow so, so, oh, oh yeah, we're in. Uh, oh, okay. Oh shit, it is now. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is national. Anything within thirty miles is national now. I mean, I'm thinking about buying a house out, not in Mount Juliet, but Spring, 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 something, Spring Hill, Spring Hill, and it's not. But I think I would say about it took a long time. You know, I got a degree. Um, having a book really helped. Um, having it edited, or I, I edited. I've got several edited books that I, by editing, I mean I curated. Like I brought all those material together. Yeah. Go to my website and see what I'm talking about. Um, you know, and I was teaching and doing. What happened was I was working. I was teaching a workshop out of my out of my house. Just you know, just like getting paid fifty bucks for for a one day workshop. And, Somebody asked me to edit their manuscript, and I was like, okay, great. So, and then more people asked me, and I, and I just built a portfolio of books that were published out in the world. Self-published is just fine, because there's lots of people self-published, and that's actually where my name goes. And the people who have my name who are publishing books, you don't want to go through the process and a lot of time. It's not very good, but you're just copy editing, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so the trick is to build a portfolio, have a good website, and seek out different like editing organizations. So if someone's looking for an editor, they'll Google, find an editor. So Google that and find the groups and you can join those. Sometimes they cost money, sometimes they don't. And then you can get, then say, so I Google for an editor, I discovered the EFA editor of the I click on that and then I can describe my book and send it out to thousands of editors. So if you're in that group, you're one of them and you can bid on the job and figure out. But it took about, I mean, it took, once I started editing, it took like 10 years, but if I had like really focused on it, it would probably take like five. Um, but to get an editing job, I mean, I remember that. I don't have a lot of advice in that regard, but that just requires a degree and just some experience and some just getting a job. If you have a job at an editing firm, obviously you're going to build a portfolio like quicker. But what I would do is I would just to start very inexpensively editing your peers' work or just keeping your eyes open and looking around. You can even just start a website that says you're an editor. And just, I mean, like I said, you become a poet and say you're a poet, you become an editor and say you're an editor. There's actually no degree that doesn't fix it. Oh my God. That's what the English degree basically is. So that's a very quick, dirty answer to your question. Um, anyway, so. Not a bad decision. Just a class I'm not here. Oh, 
It's not a good form. Now, to be a lecturer or an adjunct or something like that, that's not, to become an adjunct is, is pretty easy. It sucks. You know, it's, it's like, it's teaching high school. It's bad, you know? So it's, it's difficult. But, and then you have to have a master's at least. So you're looking at postgraduate. Um, but like, you know, University of Southern California has a degree in like publishing. And, so there are degrees out there, but honestly, you, 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 can, you can get started now and you just build a portfolio of some wait, sort. Look, Self publishing is a book on your own. Of your own. You can just do a book like that and say, I publish it. I mean, I literally need to write some piece of crap and publish it on Amazon. I won't see just that. But like, it doesn't have to be the degree. You just need to convince other people to do it. And then you can help them do it. It's about helping people achieve their dreams. Except that only after a more than anything else. And if you can make that argument and do it very well, then you're good. And teaching is good. Do that in addition. Like I, I, I still teach online. It comes to things like this. Good to meet you, man. Want to see you tomorrow? Yeah? Awesome. Great. I appreciate it. See you then. Thank you. Be well. Yeah, I have one short story. I've been rejected for like 10 different places. One day it took semifinalists of 